Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our sixth meeting of the Massachusetts Deconstruction Workgroup. I'm going to first share my screen. I can... Hopefully you can all see that okay. Uh, my name is Kathy Mirza, and I'm the branch chief for municipal waste reduction programs here at MassDEP. Uh, these meetings are designed to connect stakeholders from all perspectives so that we can share what we know, learn together, and yes. take some meaningful steps to expand back. reuse opportunities in Massachusetts. Um, please be sure to mute yourself when you enter the room. Thank you. Um, today's meeting is going to be a little bit different from what we've done in the past. Uh, several folks from our planning team will be leading the discussion today. So I'm going to start with a snapshot of key learnings from our first five meetings. Then Abby Massaro will touch on some essential elements that are found in deconstruction and reuse ordinances implemented across the U.S. Then we'll have Susan Casino from the city of Boston and Randy Scott from Select Demo who will share some steps that are being taken in two local municipalities that are helping to enable deconstruction and reuse here. Um, then we'll turn it back to Michael Orbank, who's gonna lead us in a conversation about next steps. And we will open up the floor to hear from you. So before we dive in, as usual, I'd like to give a few housekeeping reminders. Um, please note that this meeting is being recorded and this recording is made available to all attendees and then posted on MassDEP's website. Um, as mentioned, please be sure you mute when you come into the room. And it's, it's ideal if you would put your name and organization um, on screen so that we can see who's with us today. If you're unfamiliar with Zoom, you can click on the three dots in the top right corner of your image and select rename. Or you can go down to the participants icon and rename yourself there. If you have any questions that you wanna ask or information you'd like to share with the group, please feel free to use the chat box throughout the, the meeting today. So as usual, we start our meetings with a couple of quick polls to see who is with us today. And so everyone can see that. So Janice, if you would please launch the first poll and we ask folks what uh, sector you represent. If you could just take a moment and complete that, please. Did it launch? It did launch. Yep, it looks like we have about 78% who've responded. So anyone else, if you haven't responded, it would be great if you could do so now so we could capture as many of you as possible. We're at 85%. And a few more. Why don't you, if anyone else could please respond. There we go. And I think we can end the poll. Okay. And then we like to launch the second poll, which is to ask if it's okay to share your contact information with other work group participants who request it. So this is just a real quick yes or no. And so, yeah, thank you, Janice, for launching that second poll. Sure. We certainly will respect if you prefer not to have your contact information shared. We just wanna give the opportunity to network if um, folks don't mind just sharing their email addresses with one another. And we have 76% that responded. Anyone else, if you could just pop in a yes or no, if you're okay about sharing. I'll give you another second or two. Okay, and why don't we end this poll then? Okay, very good. Thank you very much. So a quick introduction for those who are new to this work group. Um, MassDEP established the Reduce and Reuse Working Group as part of our 2030 Solid Waste Master Plan. And at the end of 2021, um, we released our first Reduce and Reuse Action Plan as we're really trying to address, uh, uh, really direct more of our attention and resources to upstream waste and greenhouse gas emissions. 
So through the various stakeholder meetings that we had, we identified building materials as a priority stream for reuse. That led to the development of this deconstruction work group. Now our kickoff meeting was September of 2022, and we have had five quarterly meetings so far. Each meeting has been designed to feature a different topic, allowing for a deep dive into a variety of issues and resources that can enable growth in the building reuse sector. So as you can see here, we have a uh, planning team that helps uh, bring these meetings together. And this team represents uh, industry, nonprofit organizations and officials from federal, state and local governments. So we're really grateful for their time and expertise in helping to coordinate these meetings. Now on this slide shows a snapshot of the goals that we have for this group. And while DEP uses a waste reduction lens for the work that we do, our, our work really does dovetail with what's happening in a variety of these different sectors. And so these meetings are intended to kind of help educate each other, share knowledge that we have, and learn about things like reuse market opportunities, uh, local deconstruction practices, adaptive reuse, as well as other tools and resources that can help us move forward. So you can see we've held five meetings, as I mentioned, since September of 2022, with a range of guest speakers delving into the topics that are listed here on this slide. And if you happen to have missed any of these meetings, all of the recordings and presentations can be found on MassDEP's website. And then at the end of this slide deck, we have a link to that to make it easier for you to access. So I wanna just quickly pop through each of the five meetings and call out some of the key learnings that we had from each of them. So in our, at our kickoff meeting, we learned that about 30% of all discarded materials in Massachusetts are from construction and demolition activities. So it's a tremendous amount of waste. We were also introduced to the term embodied carbon for those who are not familiar with it. Embodied carbon in the built environment comes from the emissions derived from the extraction, manufacturing, transportation, installation, maintenance, and disposal of materials. It's all of those, those inputs that go into those materials. And as buildings become more energy efficient in, their, in the way they operate and use energy, we've been told from EPA and they've shared information that nearly half of the greenhouse gas emissions from newer buildings will be from embodied carbon. We also learned in this first meeting that we're hearing about deconstruction ordinances that are burgeoning in different parts of the country. There are incentives and advisory groups that are popping up all over the US and Canada in this building reuse space. We've learned that reuse is very possible when we can really put our heads together and understand the benefits and technologies, the training opportunities and the partnerships that can help make this happen. And so that's part of why we're here as a work group to help connect some of these dots. So at our second meeting, we, we highlighted some trailblazers who've been deconstructing buildings for decades. We had Dave Benink from the Building Deconstruction Institute, as well as Eric Kruger and Dave Giese from Deconstruction Works. And we learned a lot. We learned that the demolition of one American home is equivalent to a lifetime's worth of trash for one individual. We heard that more than 25 different categories of materials can be captured for reuse, and that Upwards of 60% of a house can go toward reuse and about a third toward recycling, leaving very little for trash. They really um, shared with us how, in their experience, deconstruction supports green collar jobs. Um, the future holds design for disassembly to enable more of this deconstruction and that a trained workforce can really deconstruct a house on a very cost competitive basis, reducing toxins and helping both low-income and cost-conscious renovators. At our third meeting, we took a closer look at reuse markets with speakers from Eco Building Bargains, Boston Building Resources, and Doors Unhinged. It was incredibly impressive to hear how much material is being diverted for reuse, the variety of materials that can be captured before deconstruction or demolition, and the value of these materials in the reused marketplace. 
We heard about services that are provided to individuals, to residential contractors and commercial contractors, how embodied carbon can be substantially reduced when we use reclaimed materials. We heard about the endless supply of materials that are out there in these spaces to capture and bring back, coupled with a real need to increase demand for those materials once they're available. And last but not least, they mentioned how procure procurement standards and buy reclaimed initiatives are really important tools to support this ecosystem. And then at our last uh, meeting last June, we heard about the connection between historic preservation and lowering our carbon footprint. So our speakers shared some really powerful information. We heard loud and clear that the greenest building is the one that already exists. And it's even better if it's been retrofitted for energy efficiency. By 2040, embodied carbon in the building itself will likely represent a larger carbon footprint than operational carbon. That's the energy used to operate the building. The Massachusetts Historical Commission was on that call and they reviewed some of the tools that can help with this, including demolition delays, historic rehabilitation tax credits, as well as sample bylaws and ordinances that they make available. We learned about the CARE tool that evaluates total carbon emissions of an existing building that's being reused compared with replacement and new construction. It's an incredible tool for architects and, and designers. And last but not least, historic preservation is economic development. It helps create jobs, income, and affordable housing while reducing our carbon footprint. And then our last meeting was in October of 2023, and we featured several presentations about deconstruction and reuse practices that are already happening here in Massachusetts. We heard about the beautiful renovation of a shuttered school building that created 42 affordable housing rental units. They donated usable materials to more than 20 organizations from the previous building and recycled more than 23 tons. We heard about the successful collaboration between Simmons University, their architect, contractor, the city of Boston and Recycling Works to remove reusable items that were donated to more than a dozen organizations, diverting more than 12 tons and helping to furnish apartments for newly housed people. And then we closed out with a presentation from Dan Costello about a deconstruction project in the Boston Seaport area last fall that several of us got to go and visit firsthand. And Dan, one of the things he mentioned was that deconstruction is one of the most valuable tools in the contractor's arsenal. He mentioned the importance of having a salvageable building component, components in that space, a safe and efficient work practice for recovering those materials, enough time in the contract for deconstruction and space for organized storage. He also em emphasized that source separation is possible on every project and it really helps to control disposal costs. So that's a lot. We've heard a lot and learned a lot and those that's just a snapshot. So with all the, of this information that's been shared with us over the last 16 months, our planning team wanted to regroup with you to think about what our next steps would be to help move that needle further in Massachusetts. And so with that, I wanna hand the floor over to Abby Massaro, who will highlight what we're seeing in other parts of the US um, and they're a little bit further along. So Abby, I'll hand this over to you. Thanks, Kathy. Hello, everyone. Again, I'm Abby Massaro. I'm a senior waste reduction consultant with the Center for Ecotechnology or CET for short. Um, and I'm also a representative of the Recycling Works in Massachusetts program. And for my robust but brief part of the agenda today, I'll be highlighting findings from research that CET conducted into the policies around the country that promote deconstruction. Prioritizing reuse and recycling of building materials presents communities with opportunities to reduce waste, support the local economy and small businesses, preserve our architectural heritage and spur job creation. Uh, next slide, please. So there are several forms or phases or methods that deconstruction can be done as shown here 
on this visual that we actually helped create with the city of Boston for their deconstruction initiative. Deconstruction is scalable and can be as simple as removing cabinetry, lighting, and doors from a project all the way up to removing and re reusing these structural elements of a building like foundation, retaining walls, beams, slabs, trusses, decking, and, and much more. Adaptive reuse or maintaining the building's structure but renovating its interior for another use is one of the highest and best forms of salvaging our buildings. The material inside of the building, its age, the current market, and storage capacity all factor into which deconstruction types can best achieve a local policy's outcome. So a local government can set a singular deconstruction or diversion target, offering participants various options to choose the most suitable deconstruction approach for their project. And we'll see some examples of that in just a moment. Next slide, Kathy, please. Many of you know us, uh, but I wanted to reintroduce who we are from a deconstruction perspective. So for Massachusetts municipalities considering a deconstruction policy, Recycling Works is available to provide guidance to projects within your city. We can help builders, architects, building owners, and more identify outlets for salvaged building materials, and establish methods for recycling source separated construction and demolition or C and D materials. And every project's different, so our assistance looks a little bit different uh, every time, usually. So if you have any questions about how we can help construction projects consider deconstruction or increase recycling, please feel free to reach out to me directly or our hotline email and phone number. And in general, Recycling Works helps businesses across the state with reuse, recycling, and food recovery programs. This program is funded by the Mass DEP and delivered under contract by CET, who's the environmental nonprofit that I work for. So please use us as a resource. Next slide, Kathy. The Recycling Works program doesn't provide direct assistance to Massachusetts municipalities to get policies or ordinances enacted, but we do provide um, assistance to those building owners or contractors within cities to help get materials salvaged and C&D materials recycled. But beyond the Recycling Works program, CET has done other work related to deconstruction, including research into deconstruction ordinances and executive orders and initiatives and more throughout the country. Drafting a deconstruction ordinance involves various pieces, I'd say, to ensure its effectiveness and support that supports local needs with regulation. Um, some key aspects to include in an ordinance can be defining deconstruction, reviewing the permitting process, and requirements for the project as a whole, such as minimum materials required to be reclaimed for reuse, minimum recycling requirements identifying specific materials that must be diverted and so much more. So on your slide, you see some examples that I just picked uh, to try and cover the most varying types that are, are good examples. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list of the ordinances found across the country, um, but just some good examples to start with. Some policies to promote deconstruction or ordinances, executive orders, initiatives, and we'll hear from the city of Boston, uh, Susan Casino in just a moment. Um, as, as I mentioned, some, some policies can be initiatives as well. But cities like San Antonio, they actually conducted a, a citywide assessment to see which buildings would be the best fit for deconstruction. And what works for San Antonio might not work for Providence, Rhode Island, just as a Freeman here. Um, San Antonio requires all small scale residential structures built on or before December 31st, 1920, or December 31st, 1945, and are located within historic districts are required to be fully deconstructed. In 2021, the city of Pittsburgh signed an executive order with a set of principles to achieve deconstruction. Uh, to achieve a deconstruction policy and then launch a pilot program that's utilizing deconstruction practices on city-owned condemned properties. 
Portland, Oregon. Uh, many of us have heard of their ordinance as they became the first city in the United States to ensure that building materials are sal salvaged for reuse. So all single family homes and duplexes are subject to the deconstruction ordinance if they were built before 1940 and are designated historic. Um, the project must also hire a deconstruction contractor to perform the work and submit a deconstruction form. So I'd love to hear uh, more about, you know, your experiences with deconstruction policy. Maybe you can put it in the chat. Of course, ask any questions in the chat as well. But if you have um, more local examples too, uh, I'm here to talk about the uh, policies across the country and you'll receive a, a link to this um, resource where many more policies can be found. Again, that was a resource that CET created. So I can't get into too much more detail about these other uh, policies, but you can click these links and check check them uh, check them out further later. All right, next slide, Kathy. It's important to note that the success of deconstruction mandates depend on effective implementation, education, and collaboration between government, industry stakeholders, and the community. And as we've learned about established ordinances, um, local circumstances, including building type, age, size, and the community needs um, can be considered when implementing your deconstruction policy. Next slide, please. So here are some resources we'd like to leave you with today. If you are a municipality looking for a place to start, the crowd guide, that's the first link, has some deconstruction resolution language, which you can use possibly as a template to start your own. I've also linked to CET's Promoting the Practice of Deconstruction, which highlights those deconstruction ordinances from across the country. And there's many Recycling Works resources available to you besides our free technical assistance. Um, we drafted a blog post on the Simmons University Deconstruction Project. Um, we also have a Construction and Demolition Materials Guidance webpage, which is a great place to start to look at what exactly is deconstruction and CMDA recycling and uh, links to deconstruction contractors, reuse outlets, and so much more. I also included the Mass DEP's bulky waste characterization study and final report, which found that materials handled by CND handling facilities, such as brought to them in an open top, mixed open top dumpster from a construction project, could have been captured upstream for reuse, so before they were thrown in the dumpster. And the CARE tool, a uh, carbon avoided retrofit estimator, which Kathy already mentioned, um, essentially compares the total carbon impact of renovating an existing building versus replacing it with a new one. Um, in my last slide, uh, I just wanted to share my contact information. And I wanted to note that everyone on this deconstruction work group and likely on this call today is a, could be a resource to you. So if you have something you need or something you're curious about and been uh, looking for, feel free to share it today so we can try and get you more information that you need. So that is all for me. I'm going to hand it over to Susan Casino with the City of Boston to share all about what they have been up to in the deconstruction world. Go ahead, Susan. Thank you, Abby. And let me get to my slides. So, hold. I want to see you. Okay, so we have the first slide. Um, <clears throat> and as Abby said, my name is Susan Casino. I manage the city's deconstruction initiative and reducing demolition waste is among the strategies in Boston's zero waste plan. And as Kathy said, 30% of the state's solid waste is construction and demolition debris. And our deconstruction initiative creates an alternative to building demolition. And we are all aware of Boston's vibrant historic character. Uh, so building reuse 
and the reuse of building materials can also help ensure that our histor historic legacy will exist for years from now. Next slide, please. Um, and this is a good visual uh, that um, actually Abby also um, uh, cited from. Uh, as you can see, deconstruction takes many forms. Um, and first and foremost is the continued use of a building. Uh, and then as Abby said, um, the reuse of building, the building's contents, furniture, light fixtures, electronics can be sold or donated for reuse or recycling. And then attached items within the building like cabinets, appliances, flooring and windows can be removed for reuse or recycling. And again, uh, the structural parts can be dismantled for recycling as well. And the, all of these options represent deconstruction. So um, it's a wide range and, um, you know, that's helpful for owners and developers to see that um, there's a menu of items that they can choose from to fit their needs. Next slide, please. Um, so the city's deconstruction initiative partnered with Recycling Works of Massachusetts. So, uh, and Abby was um, the specialist from uh, Recycling Works that uh, worked on the deconstruction projects that the city had. Um, and as she said, um, they provide free technical assistance to building owners and developers, which is a big plus for um, this initiative. Um, and she also said, you know, Abby has helped with uh, drafting um, waste management plans and identifying outlets for reuse of the building assets um, or recycling of building materials. And as she said, they, they are not aligned with any um, uh, for-profit organization, they're nonprofit and their funding comes from DEP. So they don't really have any alliances with any particular uh, entity. Next slide, please. So um, here are four deconstruction projects that I have been working on. Um, Simmons University Science Building, which I'll talk about in the next slide. We had the um, Midtown Hotel, which is a 160 room um, hotel uh, downtown by Symphony Hall and a uh, seven unit Victorian residential building, which was kitty corner from the hotel. Uh, we were able to get proposals from a number of reuse organizations and five organizations were interested in both buildings contents and the architectural assets um, as well. Um, however, and this is something uh, that people should be aware of, I'm sure people who are in the development industry are deal with this all the time, but um, we got very close to making this happen and then the project got put on hold uh, for reasons unrelated to deconstruction. So as soon as they get the green light to go ahead, we'll resume our um, work with de deconstructing uh, those two buildings. Uh, third is the Bunker Hill redevelopment um, uh, site, which is uh, owned by Boston Housing Authority in Charlestown. And um, uh, this is a 10 year project, so it's going in parcels. And when we got involved in it, um, one of the parcels had been pretty much already uh, vacated. So there wasn't a lot of reuse within the buildings. But what is interesting about a number of the um, um, developments for the Boston Housing Authority is that they were built almost a hundred years ago. So now there are trees there uh, that form beautiful canopies in the developments and they're like, and they're a hundred years old. So um, it's a big deal to, uh, or a big priority to pre preserve as many of the trees as possible. But there is also um, ways to reuse some of these city trees. And that's what we've been working on. Um, so the picture isn't great, but you can see some of those large logs 
Um, so large tree trunks will be milled for furniture, which will go into some of the renovated buildings. And then some of the trees have been donated donated to the uh, Massachusetts Tribal Council um, uh, for, uh, for use by the uh, tribes, uh, uh, local tribes here um, in the area. Um, and then the fourth project, another city project is with Renew Boston Trust, which is, which is really um, all about energy retrofitting uh, city buildings. It's a pretty large portfolio of buildings. Um, so most of the zero waste work for this is recycling rather than reuse. Next slide, please. Um, and I would say uh, we have the most data and for this along with the uh, Simmons University Science Building. Uh, which was slated for demolition as part of the campus's consolidation. It was a four-story building containing biology, chemistry, physical therapy, and nutrition labs, as well as classrooms. Um, and the city, along with Recycling Works and um, Alcus Manfredi, who's the developer's architect, their um, sustainability manager, uh, we work together to ident identify as many reuse organizations as possible to claim the contents of this building. And the organizations range from the Boston Public Schools to uh, to, La to, to Life, uh, it's a senior community organization, uh, the Dorchester Food Co-op, Boston Building Resources, the Stony Brook Artists. Um, and in total, we diverted over 12 tons of material for reuse that represented um, close to 2000 items. And we worked, and those items were donated to um, 15 nonprofit organizations. Next slide, please. And lastly, um, we are often asked uh, um, what makes, what buildings are good candidates for deconstruction and how are we choosing projects for the deconstruction initiative? So primarily we have chosen projects that have committed to lead um, construction and demolition, demolition waste management credits um, because uh, you know, this shows that the developer has an interest in waste reduction and these lead credits manage, lead uh, construction and demolition waste management credits um, are for diverting three to five material waste streams and 50 to 75% by weight of this material for either reuse or recycling. Um, so, um, so also if there are any owners or developers that are interested in participating in the deconstruction initiative, they can. Um, and we have a, the city has a um, green building committee that reviews projects. So if they see a building that they think would be well suited for deconstruction, they can make recommendations um, as well. So, and that's it for me. Um, thank you. And I will pass it on to Randy. Hello. Um, well, thank you for the uh, uh, Susan and Abby. Um, I'm Randy Scott. I'm Senior Vice President of Select Demolition. Um, I'm here to try to do my part on this, uh, coming up with the waste issues we're having and uh, bringing solutions to the zero waste initiative. Um, what I have here, this is a particular project and thank you to Abby doing such a great job. Somebody had called her and she had recommended me to, uh, this was the town of Carlisle. So I talked to, um, they had called and they said, we have this project, Did you see the green old barn. Um, so I went out and met them. Um, and the whole idea is to come up with, they, they really want to do recycling. So um, I said, let's go meet and we'll figure something out here. Uh, next slide. So, 
when we went out there, the whole idea is to walk around the property. What I do first is walk around the property and try to get a list going of all potential items I think that could be repurposed or recycled. So one of the first things I saw was all this slate. You know, it was an abundance of it. Um, so that was item number one that really rung a bell. Uh, next slide. Then you go inside and you get this gorgeous post and beam uh, dimensional lumber, just uh, pretty amazing stuff. Uh, next slide. And as you see, these guys didn't, um, providing good material wasn't a problem here. They, there's some really good stuff there that could be reused. Um, next slide. So basically what I do is I, I, I try to, after I assess what's on the projects and on what I think that could be salvaged and reused. And so basically what we start with, we go on Google Earth and we got to start with our estimate. And sometimes it's just a simple footprint like this. And we just start doing a takeoff, start calculating the materials and then trying to formulate everything into a waste management plan. Uh, next slide. So this is a part of a plan that we've taken a bunch of different plans and devised on kind of a rule of thumb when you're, you're tr trying to see how much you can salvage um, when you go to these particular projects. Uh, next slide. And the next slide. So after going through everything, I kind of did a full assessment of the different products you thought you could save it. It was, it was quite a bit here. Um, and it's just calculating um, the different tonnage or yardage of what you're doing. And then, then also um, back to coming up with uh, other ideas on who they could sell this to and get, getting it on these waste streams where um, I, I, this different list, Abby has some, and I believe on Susan's site, there was also just getting more names of places that this stuff can be resourced to, um, whether it's 10 people that buy slate or 10 people that are interested in dimensional wood, uh, bricks, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I guess um, I'm, I'm out here to assist, and I know this is all going to be online, and, and if anybody's out there that needs a hand running through some of this, I'm more than happy to once again, do my part to educate people on this. Um, and I know I was probably the shortest one here. Um, but uh, feel, free, feel free to reach out. Um, here to help. Uh, I want to turn you over to Michael Warbank. Thank you, Randy. So uh... As we kind of end the presentations here, I wanted to take a moment to both uh, recap what the presentations over the past uh, couple of years now, wow, uh, have been um, really looking at the, the point of it all and then opening up for a live Q&A to the group um, to really kind of field a lot of your questions. Uh, many of the planning members are here so we can really dictate where this group uh, goes going forward and make sure it's as effective to the Commonwealth as we can be. Uh, next slide, Kathy. So looking to recap our previous meetings, really why deconstruction? Um, there's been a lot of uh, points presented, but uh, we really need to work towards not only reducing the waste that we have in our generating the Commonwealth, um, but really looking towards what does zero waste look like and using deconstruction as a pathway to get there, um, as well as looking at the, the carbon impacts and really the environmental and social impacts of a lot of this waste and C&D waste. Um, we just don't have the space for it. Looking at material reuse, uh, we've seen what is possible now, uh, but we've also looked at what does better look like? What are other parts of the country, other parts of the world doing right now? And how can we get there? When looking at policy movement, uh, we've looked at uh, several different deconstruction ordinances and, and one that's looking to start here in Boston, um, as well as demolition delays and other methods used by uh, municipalities and states to really uh, incentivize or at least bring the idea to those who are doing deconstruction. Um, 
when looking at circularity, how do we incentivize it? Uh, is it a carrot approach? Is it a stick approach? Um, and really, what are the entities that are looking to incentivize it? Uh, as well as looking at the many uh, grants, tax breaks, and funding opportunities that are available uh, right now and projected going forward. Uh, and lastly, really circularity and what is going to be successful in Massachusetts. Uh, looking at historic preservation and looking at technology, two very currently underutilized pathways to really find success in deconstruction, reuse, and pushing towards a circular economy. Next slide, please. So really, uh, before we get to the Q&A, what's the point of it all? So we want to reduce and divert a lot of the waste that's coming out. We want to meet the, the Mass DEP's uh, solid waste master plan goals. Uh, we're really reducing the waste burden of landfill waste that is, is crushing us right now. Uh, we're looking at the, the carbon and environmental impact, really making sure to keep embodied carbon within the built environment, um, but also reducing this carbon intensity and meeting the climate goals that we need to meet. There's a huge part uh, of it that is economic development and making sure that we're keeping these materials, these resources uh, within the communities that they are being taken out of. So we can really support those communities. We can make sure that we're pushing towards workforce training for deconstruction, uh, enabling the next generation or those working right now, the skills to make sure that they can um, remove these materials, but also find a pathway to resell them. And we can reduce the cost of, of renovations or, or even new builds with these materials that have been salvaged. Uh, and lastly, really understanding historic preservation, uh, the significance and importance that it holds within the communities that uh, it's in, really looking to enable adaptive reuse and make sure that uh, if a building is at its end of its perceived uh, lifespan, that we can not only keep that building in use, but maybe add a, a new interior life to it and push that forward so we don't have to take everything down and really keep adding to that carbon burden that we have. Uh, next slide. So lastly, uh, looking at next steps, the, this mess, uh, DEP deconstruction group, we're looking to really hold a, a, a shred or a workshop series in 2024 to really make sure that we can reach out to the municipalities, to the communities, uh, to those in the Commonwealth who want to push this forward, who want to enact policy, who enact ordinance, or really just understand what they can do to push it uh, in their communities uh, and, and where they work. So, um, uh, we'll look to open it up now for any live Q&A. Um, if you do have a question, please feel free to uh, use the raise hand function uh, and take yourself kind of off mute. Um, as well, if you have questions and you um, you want to put them in the chat, uh, we'll also look to, to address those there. Um, and before I do, I will say uh, for those who don't have all the time, after you leave, there will be a survey uh, that is sent out um, not only when you leave the Zoom, it should pop up for you. Um, feel free to uh, give us your honest feedback. Uh, some of the questions, um, what more do you want to see out of this group? Uh, how can we help you? Are you interested in participating in the 2024 workshop series? Um, and for those of you who don't do it after Zoom, we'll also be sending it out to your email address to those who signed up as well. So Michael, this is Abby. I was thinking we could start while people are uh, brewing their questions in their minds uh, to be shared out loud or in the chat. We have a question in the Q&A section from Kaylee. Um, and they ask, what are the kinds of implication strategies that can be used for smaller renovation projects? So I think that depends on if it's a residential, small re residential renovation or commercial renovation, but does anyone want to speak to that? Was the question the implications of it? Yeah. So when when looking at kind of pushing towards a circular economy, uh, a lot of times if you have a, a, a to say, a construction project in general, um, if it's a anywhere from kind of a smaller residential all the way up to commercial, uh, a lot of times those, those goods and materials that are, are looking to not only go in, but eventually come out of that project, um, there's oftentimes a very defined, not only uh, cost, but uh, time or lead time for those materials um, by kind of not only through policy, but also kind of enabling with technology and, and really helping these reuse vendors and circular economy companies um, 
a more realized circular economy, I think, helps a lot in those um, those different projects and and, and different um, uh, fit outs because it enables a lot of these materials to not only stay local and not kind of have the carbon emissions of transporting, but oftentimes are, are much cheaper um, because they don't have to come from new, transported from a, a manufacturer very, very far away. Um, and oftentimes it's going to be a lot cheaper than disposing of them to not only keep them in circulation, but to put them into a new project. Um, so what I think a lot of other uh, places in the country have seen is when you start enabling deconstruction, you start enabling reuse, you start really benefiting the local economy. You make sure that um, not only are you looking to benefit these workforce training and workforce development, um, but you're decreasing the time it takes to get materials to site. You're helping uh, the community and reuse vendors kind of grow uh, and and really build up. And it, it's just um, reducing the cost and time for projects. Positive implications, which is great. Thank you. Um, does anyone else want to ask a question? I was also reminded that we have a poll to launch this. Yeah, Abby, this is uh, this and is Dan Costello calling, and thank everybody for their presentations today. And I have I have one very important item to add to this, and is that we all have to be aware of the need to do asbestos surveys before this type of work takes place. I know Randy and I are used to it on larger larger projects where an asbestos survey is a normal part of what we do, but on smaller projects, it's it's equally and perhaps more important to have an asbestos survey before you start. You can find asbestos in areas that you least expect it, like window caulking and uh, drywall compound in uh, gypsum wallboard. Uh, pipe insulation it would be something that everybody would think of, but there are so many categories of asbestos otherwise that it's really critical that in any deconstruction project we have a, an asbestos survey. And you think of the implications, these, these facilities, these buildings are going to continue to be occupied, so you don't want to run the risk of contaminating them with asbestos fibers. It's not, uh, again, Randy and I see it on, on larger projects, but it can be very easily overlooked on, on smaller projects, but it's, it's equally as important, perhaps more important. So I just, I don't mean to be the skunk at the lawn party, but I just mean to throw out that it's, it's crucially important to these projects to be aware of the asbestos acid that could exist. Thank you. Um, just one, I saw uh, Mike Price just that popped up and I responded in the chat. Um, he asked, is there a discussion of architects starting to put deconstruction requirements into RFPs? Um, coming from the commercial construction side, I have seen more RFPs or requests for proposals um, and, and project requirements for new projects starting to include uh, considerations for salvage, reuse. Um, I will say it is still fairly a uh, new practice, especially in commercial construction, to really on a large scale incorporate a lot of these um, different materials or guidelines. Um, that's just because uh, there is not as developed, I think, of a, of a market or an industry as we'd like. Um, but Gensler, uh, a major architect, recently uh, revealed their 2024 standards for projects, which include, while a lot of it's looking at carbon and things like uh, EPDs or environmental project decorations, they do have uh, reuse, salvage, um, and, and some circularity that they're looking to build off of uh, as they refine these specs. And that's for across their portfolio, looking to incorporate on all new projects. Michael, it looks like a couple of responses in the chat also came through. One from Cornell University's Circular Construction Lab that says they have a de deconstruction RFP draft on their website. And Diane Cohen shared the link so that others can look at it. And Melissa Wenzel from uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Authority mentioned that Minnesota created the deconstruction RFP template as well. 
uh, for which I have a copy if folks are interested in looking at that too. So we do have some examples out there that we can look to. Um, I'm not sure if you'd like to um, have Janice launch that third poll now, because part of that is to sort of ask what people um, would like to uh, hear a little bit more about, and that might help to seed some questions from the group here that are participating. So Janice, if you could launch that, would be great. You just let me know when you want me to close it because I, I don't see it moving on my end. Sure, you got it. And so this asks which issues or roadblocks around implementing deconstruction and reuse practices do you still need more information about? And I believe this allows multiple choice responses so you can click more than one. And we'll give folks a moment here to, to, uh, to share some feedback because this is really going to help guide some of our uh, work for you as well. Uh, and I would say while people are taking the poll um, earlier and we can bring it to the bottom, uh, uh, Melissa Wenzel did post a, uh, a wiki link. So that's for the uh, Build Reuse Wiki. I find that incredibly powerful tool um, in that uh, a lot of questions can be answered, such as, can I see an example of a working uh, deconstruction ordinance? Uh, maybe something looking at case studies from different parts of the country. Um, so uh, please do visit that and hopefully we get something that as a resource because uh, a very powerful resource. We get to close the poll. It looks like 70 folks are still um, adding to it. We're up to 72% have participated. So uh, maybe just a couple more seconds, but it does, we are seeing responses basically for just about everything that was listed there. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I do think we can end that now. Mm -hmm. And um, I yeah, can folks see the results here? You can see how this came in. Um, so really across the board, a lot of interest in many different areas from reuse outlets, legislation and policy template language, financial incentives, working policies and ordinary, every, pretty much everything here. So um, thank you. Thank you for completing that. Uh, one of the questions in the chat was, do people scan for lead paint? Um, I would say yes, but Randy, if you want to take this and kind of dive in a little bit more as an actual practitioner. Randy, Uh, yes, I, I definitely think, as Dan brought up the asbestos, the same goes with the, the lead paint. Um, you know, if you find an older piece of wood you're trying to finish or any of the paint, it's strongly suggested, uh, have it tested. They can come in and uh, test it in multiple ways. I'd call a, 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 a registered consultant and I strongly suggest you have that done. Um, Dan Castell, do you want to add a little to that? Um, no, just to follow through on it, if you're keeping that, the, the it's if you're using that material, refinishing it, uh, reutilizing it anyway, then you're going to have to have lead sampling on it, lead paint sampling, because you're going to be volatilizing that paint if you're sanding it or, or working with it in any way. So um, it is one of the, the obstacles that we do find oftentimes to salvaging historic millwork or historic wooden surfaces that the cost of, of removing that lead paint is often more than the value of replacing the material. So it's certainly a health hazard, a very serious health, health hazard with lead paint and testing needs to be done. 
just like with the asbestos, if you're not used to dealing in that world, then um, you need to be accustomed to it and recognize it because there are some very real dangers that your workforce could face. Thank you. Um, I do see that Pam Holland has her hand up. Pam, do you want to speak? Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, so I've been restoring old windows for the last 15 years, uh, teaching women how to restore. Can you hear me? Yes. You can hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, teaching women how to restore old windows. And one of the great things about it is that um, folks who learn to restore old windows can in, can do a lot of other things once um, once they realize how valuable these old materials are. Um, the problem with the lead paint testing in old houses is that just about all of the interior um, trim work is lead painted. You can assume that that's just a given. And so when we're restoring windows, we assume that that's a given. But there are a lot of ways that um, people can be can protect themselves and their families. It's just a lot of attention to detail uh, around basic housekeeping and and um, personal personal protective equipment. But we shouldn't be afraid of it. We shouldn't be afraid to do it because so much of the really high quality wood in our built environment came through those years of when lead paint was the the thing that most um, maintained old exterior parts of buildings so from a historic preservation standpoint and also from a standpoint of training a workforce and really educating the whole populace um you know dealing with lead paint can be approached from a lot of different angles. And I'd like to see a kind of a focus on that alone because of how much waste is created by lead paint. Um, Do you have a website or a contact to show some of your window restoration projects? Sure. Well, the oldwindowworkshop.com is our website. Um, Hello. Um, hey, I'm listening. I'm on a mass DEP. Hi. Um, Zoom meeting. Oh, actually, oh. wait a minute. Let me just... Wait, I just want to make sure. I think Carol unmuted herself on next time. Pam, if you want to continue. Karen, I think you need to use <laughs> Okay. And Pam, are your workers lead licensed? Do they go through formal lead training? We did have um, a grant to actually allow that. The, the yeah. eight hour course is expensive because you, it's, it's yeah. just expensive. And the most important uh, thing is to have one person trained in every group who can, you know, who can enforce the procedures that will protect everyone. Great. I'll look forward to seeing some of your work. Oh, great. <laughs> when you scan over the, the photos of some of our uh, pictures of our of our work, um, if you stay on the photo, it'll come up with an explanation of what we're doing. Excellent. Yeah, thanks. I'll look to that. Plus, I'd love to talk to you more about it. Yes, I'd like to talk to you. I'm, I'm working with Cord Jablonski uh, to... To, to look at ways that we can have more and more, especially women, be able to restore old windows. Yeah, I have some and, thoughts for you, so I, I'll look forward to talking to you. Thanks a million. I'll, I'll make sure we get back to you. Okay. Um, I see Anne, your hand is up. You want to unmute and answer a question? Hi. 
Ann Lusk, uh, by the way, I can mention that I'm an extremely good window restorer. I have even mastered the craft of cutting old wavy glass. Ah! <laughs> I bought all the old windows at New England Demolition in New Bedford for this 1820 house. See the old beams up above? Oh, excellent. Excellent, Ann. <laughs> the issue, and I also did 32 sash for my daughter's house in Rosendale. I convinced them they needed to keep the old windows, but that, of course, meant that I had to strip them and reglaze all the windows for them. Fantastic. And don't you find it's perfect work for women to do if it they have perfect. access to a space and they can set their own hours? It is perfect. My question for everyone, there are now many stores for buying secondhand clothing. And we've also increased the demand for buying secondhand clothing. It's more prestigious to go and buy something secondhand and brag about it. We haven't done the same thing for recycled materials. New England Demolition was a phenomenal resource. You could go there and get everything you wanted. Um, Bruce Willis was even at New England Demolition one day when I went there. So it was sort of a hot spot to go to. Now there is architectural salvage in New Hampshire but Boston Building Resources and Habitat for Humanity don't have the same type of resources, especially for historic preservation houses pre-1940. To have the deconstruction complemented by acquisition, how to increase the numbers of vendors, and how do we also tell people this is as sexy as buying secondhand clothing? Thanks. Uh, I can take a little bit of that just from kind of obviously working in, in construction. Um, a lot of the materials that can be pulled out right now, they don't have a demand to kind of go back in. So going along with your kind of what, how to make them sexy, um, it really requires um, kind of the decision makers, the owners, whether it's on a residential scale, whether it's on a commercial scale, to really kind of feel the need to put them in and then the downstream trickle of making sure that uh, designers and architects can can be assured that these materials not only are there but they're of a certain quality to go into a new project and really kind of moving that forward um, i will say there has been increased demand understanding that uh, reused and, and salvaged materials have a lower carbon impact so on a extremely commercial scale um, companies that need to kind of meet certain kind of ESG or, or carbon reporting metrics are starting to see the value of this lower carbon. Um, but it really takes kind of all of the players in this ecosystem to kind of develop at the same time in order to kind of really get this going. Uh, currently, places like Boston Building Resources are expanding a bit into getting more materials, but a lot of that comes with the need for space and, and hosting them. And then at the same time, um, if they have the materials, how are Bossman Resources, uh, things like the Furniture Trust, the, the, the Eco Building Bargains, showing that they have those materials? And that requires a, a technology platform or a way to get not only what the material is out to those who could be the decision makers, but also show that where is it? Is it of good enough quality? Um, so uh, a lot of what we're seeing in, in not only these meetings, but in the, in the region is that um, we all kind of have to take steps at the same time, but a lot of that can be dictated by um, policy movement and incentivization to really kind of kickstart that. Um, and then uh, an educational push as well to make sure that uh, everywhere from the, the typical person who wants to renovate their own home all the way up to the, the biggest possible commercial project can really understand that, oh, there is something that I can put in this project. Um, and that takes education as well. I'd also add that um, the Boston Building Resources, Eco Building Bargains, and Habitats um, typically focus on reclaiming building materials that work well in homes and like the residential type settings. And I know at least for Eco Building Bargains and, and, and BBR too, it is um, a priority to provide affordable materials to people in your community. Um, so they're able to do renovations with reclaimed building materials um, versus buying new. And typically what I've seen on the few projects that I've worked on with historical type items, those ones go in a flash, uh, typically because they can be sold like to Northeast or um, you know, other other local contractors, for example. Um, so I'll just add that there. It looks like Andrew has a comment or question. I can go to you next. 
Thank you. So I'm actually from Boston Building Resources, and I just wanted to chime in a bit. Like Michael hit the nail on the head, our big constraints are space and market. We are a nonprofit. Everything that comes to us is donated. We don't really have the capacity to go out and collect things like architectural salvage places. And so it's a, you know, it's a logistics problem. And when one place like this is trying to do it on its own, um, it's a real challenge to figure out how you generate the, um, the person power, the, the sort of marketing push and everything you need to have a successful reuse business. Um, so it's great to see groups like this where people can come together and, and share their ideas. Um, are there any other questions that we're seeing or anyone else wants to speak in it? Act up. Yes. Uh, Abby, I think there's a question for you in the chat, actually. Just put in. Yeah, I was actually going to bring up Chelsea. Well, I think there's a few Chelsea Blanchards. <laughs> yeah. In I'm sorry, I shared my link and I, I know I wasn't supposed to. So our whole office is probably using my name. I'm sorry. <laughs> where, so tell, tell us where you're from. Um, and I want to talk about your mm -hmm. first question too about um, the city of Boston's mm -hmm. Waste initiative and article Lady Tile. So, mm -hmm. so there are, go. yeah, of course. So um, there are many of us from our office here today. I think all of us, we, we canceled our regular staff meeting to um, be able to come and, and join this group today. Um, my So I, I'm the staff architect at the Landmarks Commission in Boston, and um, I handle the Article 85 process, which is our um, somewhat inadequate demo delay process. And um, I was just wondering, we've talked with um, Susan Casino's uh, department about sort of how deconstruction and demo delay should probably be working in concert. And I was just wondering if you noticed in other cities if they were connected ever. Oh, I think you're muted, Abby. Um, yes, I did not notice that specifically. Um, but it seems kind of like a gateway to, um, or, you know, and I don't work at a municipality or, or anything like that. So in, in my mind, it's more common to have a demolition delay and historic preservation um, policy than to have a deconstruction ordinance, at least in Massachusetts. I know there are some municipalities across the state that already have those. Um, so whether or not those turn into, I mean, I'll throw it out to the rest of the committee if they have any other thoughts on that, but it seems like it can be We're going to trailblaze, Chelsea. <laughs> I know. So I, was, I was hoping we could just copy someone. <laughs> it's it's Murray, well, Miller, uh, Murray Miller, Director of Office of Historic Preservation. I must uh, admit I'm the guilty one for asking that question that was uh, redirected to Chelsea. So Chelsea, I probably was riding on your um your link to ask about the relationship between discussions uh, uh in relation to the um a zero waste boston initiative and article 85 and i acknowledge that while it is common for historic preservation to be affiliated with demolition delay ordinances what we are, are thinking in historic preservation is that we may need to think differently about the purpose because the purpose of article 85 and other demolition delay mechanisms do not achieve the purpose of preservation so if we were looking at this from an environmental stewardship perspective i.e in a line with a zero waste initiative we could achieve environmental outcomes while at the same time achieving beneficial historic preservation outcomes as well as other outcomes that may not be tied specifically to um, historic structures. So you may have general structures that may not be particularly significant historically but may have reuse value um, so that's a, it's a broader issue, and so we're curious as to about 
uh, as to whether or not those discussions were actually connecting. And I know that um, um, Allison is going to uh, push on that issue. So thank you, Allison. Mm -hmm. And I think we are going to do all we can to uh, to push on that issue because I think there there are the elements that suggest these things ought to be connected. Well, I just want to take a minute to say this is a historic precedent, right, that we are witnessing right here for the City of Boston Landmarks to be part of this discussion. So thank you for joining this conversation. And also thank you for rec Oh, so the, the gentleman that was just speaking is our uh, is the city's director of historic preservation. Um, so the fact that um, you all and your whole staff have come to this is just a, a, a powerful statement of making those connections. And to Alison Frazee as well for pointing out that uh, <clears throat> the connection between achieving zero waste and historic preservation. And really, I think because I come from the waste world, and so we look at waste when it's waste. Mm -hmm. You all have the expertise of how to preserve these materials in these buildings. So this is where the reuse can come in. You know, historically, we have focused on, on, on recycling. We need to focus on reuse, reduce reuse. So um, I'm just thrilled um, to see you all participating in this. And now we just have to uh, stretch our arms further with, um, you know, public works that handles uh, waste with our, our our departments, our planning departments. As you know, we've been working with um, the IGBC in terms of getting projects. But what you all point out in historic preservation is that by the time the development projects come in for their permitting, they've already, uh, you know, they're not they're not looking to reuse their buildings. So right. So welcome and thank you. And I'm sorry I yes. took that aside, but just everyone, this is terrific. No, we certainly appreciate the opportunity to participate. I think it's an important discussion. And I think the timing is now with all the emphasis on uh, mitigating adverse effects to climate action, um, zero waste, environmental stewardship, all of these things touch historic preservation. And I think we, we all have to realize that there are many aspects of these challenges that we share. We may have different names for them, but we are all, I think, looking for a similar outcome. So thanks for the invite. Uh, one thing I'll quickly add, in addition to something like a demo delay, I would group that in with kind of uh, permitting incentives that some municipalities have found very effective in really kind of slowing down the typical, at times, very quick role of we want to build it, we want to knock everything down, we want to rebuild, we want to go as close as possible. Um, something like uh, working with the, uh, the permitting department in, in a municipality has been very effective at times to uh, provide either a, a, a timing benefit, it, something like a Seattle or Portland, um, if you can on the initial permit application show that you're taking a lens of historic preservation, you're going out of your way to make sure that you're salvaging material or or making a conscious efforts to be better um, than those benefits of either kind of lower permit costs or more effectively lower permit time, uh, a quicker time to get that permit and to actually get to work. Um, is very, very strong in kind of reinforcing or at least promoting um, uh, better deconstruction and reuse practices. I think also in relation to um, following up from Michael, um, that reflects a some form of uh, incentive. But I think we we have to have bigger carrots for incentivizing best outcomes. But also we need to think about meaningful disincentives for work that contributes to increasing climate change uh, and that are inconsistent with the objectives of a zero waste city. So we need both incentives and disincentives. Uh, Donna, you have your hand up. 
Thank you. This has been a, a, a great conversation and I really appreciate uh, the presentations and the comments that have been shared. The um, the great exchange was really thrilled to be able to, to play a role in what was accomplished at, in the science building at Simmons College. And we look forward to um, expanding our involvement with these kind of initiatives. I'm wondering if, if anyone has insider opinions on what the opportunities might be around new construction projects to recover building materials that did not get used on, on a new project development. Um, I would say that manufacturers are becoming better and better at not only taking their product that has been installed, um, something like a manufacturer take back program through uh, carpeting or on trunk ceilings, um, but have been really opening up the ability to start kind of returning a lot of those uh, surplus materials. Now, oftentimes there will be requirements of we want a full truckload of something or we want that. Um, but manufacturers have been at least improving and hopefully will continue to improve um, how we can get those either excess surplus or materials that are going in these new builds to make sure they aren't just mindlessly going to waste or being thrown in dumpsters and I hope it works out kind of thing. If everyone else wants to take that. Great, Th thank you. That's really good to hear, thank you. Uh, Melissa. Thank you. I wanted to jump in on that uh, particular question. Well, my hair is not great, whatever. Um, it's been drilled into my head that only 10% of the, the materials going to C&D landfills are um, construction related. That said, they have a potential for possible use. I won't even say reuse if it didn't get used in the first place. Um, we have a very small rural uh, construction demolition landfill where contractors are dropping off their stuff for redistribution. They have a diversion reuse program at this county owned landfill. And so instead of trying to figure out what else to do with it or send it to the landfill itself, people are bringing it in for the county to sell at a low cost for, for redistribution. Um, the second thing I wanted to point out is that um, I'm not even sure how this partnership really happened and I don't get any credit. I shouldn't get any credit for it, but we have a waste hauler working with the construction company, working with Habitat Lacrosse. Um, they have a demolition program and obviously building material reuse program. And me, um, we're working together to have a case study of a low waste construction project. And we're going to utilize, or rather they are going to utilize all of the mm -hmm. techniques like separate roll-offs for separate types of materials for reuse or recycling or repurposing. Um, I can't remember anything else beyond that, but they're going to try to have a case study and have an example of a low-waste construction project and what went into that. So there's definitely an interest in that and also seeing a movement of more um, construction within factory settings and not stick build. There's a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of waste when you build in the field versus in a factory. And you're building the same things, you're just being more efficient and having less waste and keeping the materials handy nearby, whatever, in a factory. So three thoughts. Uh, I would add to that quickly. I responded in the chat uh, to a question, but um, right now in the state of Mass, uh, the processors and, and CMB facilities um, can only do so much. The, the diversion rates are only as good as they are, um, but an emerging best practice, along with kind of what Melissa said, is looking at site separation. Um, so not only the waste that's coming off, but any of the excess waste uh, and making sure that it is not only kind of kept segregated and, and pure for what it is, um, but once you have that, once it needs to leave the construction site, it doesn't have to go to a CD processor. If you have scrap metal historically has been very easy, but nowadays uh, paper and cardboard can find an easy recycler in most areas in the Commonwealth. Um, uh, some construction uh, companies, including uh, my own, looking at 
clean gypsum wallboard waste um, and how kind of rough that can be on a lot of CD processors as the fines get everywhere by separating that, making sure it doesn't get commingled. You can then take it to um, uh, a facility that will ship it to a USA Gypsum in Pennsylvania with Terry Weaver and actually use that and right now downcycling, yes, um, but making sure that it doesn't add to that problem um, and you don't have to go through a process of that. So uh, a lot of emerging best practices. Yeah, thank right. you for that. Well, I did want to add, I want to say something as far as what uh, Donna was asking. Um, as far as I'm in the middle of trying to put together, the biggest problem is the space. So trying to obtain all the space needed for this new used uh, materials. Uh, we'll have more information down the road where we're just getting these warehouses together. But uh, there's a lot of new used stuff getting thrown out and uh, obtaining that surplus before it even leads to job sites is what we're lining up. Um, there'll be more to come on that. Um, if you have interest, then once again in the chat, you can get my information and contact me. be great could you put your contact information in the chat please yeah thank you i just want to mention that if there's someone you wanted to talk to today that you didn't get their email address uh, feel free to reach out to one of the people that you know in our work group and stay tuned for the list of contacts if you agreed to have your information shared publicly uh, with this group, <laughs> you'll be receiving that. I think Michael had to hop off. Um, I don't know, Kathy, I think we have a few more minutes for the q and Is that right? Or did you want to take the floor? We actually have, it's, I've got 254, so very few left, but I okay. guess I have, I have one thing I wanted to put out there and then I might just um, wrap it up at this point. Um, um, mentioning the case study that Melissa mentioned in Minnesota, I guess to put this out there for anybody who might who is here today, um, any other you know public sector buildings that we might be able to uh, capture a case study from, I think would be really interesting as well to hear whether it's a, a city or town built you know a municipal building or a state building what have you um, that might be going through this kind of process. I think that could be interesting to include in the mix of resources um, in addition to a you know a private building. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to share before we uh, just kind of wrap it up? I've got just like one or two things I want to mention before we close it. I'm not seeing any hands up. Okay, well, this this has been a fabulous discussion today. I'm really grateful for all of the engagement and what you've all shared in the questions. We'll capture the chat with Genesis help. We're capturing this. Um, and as Abby mentioned, if folks want to uh, connect again, just reach out and say you'd like to connect with any individual here. Um, a couple things I'd like to mention. Um, once the Zoom meeting is closed, we have a survey that's going to be available for everybody who's on this call today, but also for the larger deconstruction work group, which is a really, really big group at this point, the broadcast list that I have that's gonna just allow people a little more time to sort of think about the things that we can try to bring to the table in future meetings as we plan that would help you in your particular sector move things forward. So keep on the lookout for that, that'll be coming soon. Um, the slide that's up now um, just mentions a save the date for our next deconstruction work group, which will be in April. Um, and I wanted to just mention that if folks aren't aware of the um, EBC's annual construction and demolition summit that's later next week uh, for folks who are here in Massachusetts and interested in that. Um, Mike Elliott is a, is a mover and shaker in that space amongst others. And I also wanted to just give a really heartfelt shout out to Susan Casino here on the call from the city of Boston. Um, Susan is retiring soon in early February, so she won't be part of the planning team after today, um, and we will miss her dearly. And I just wanna thank you, Susan, for being just such an inspiration and a leader in Boston for decades, for decades. And I'm delighted that so many people from Boston were on the call today. 
um, and are going to hopefully continue working on this waste reduction meeting of historic preservation for the city of Boston. It's immense work. And I just wanted to give you a really heartfelt shout out. Um, thank uh, you, last... Susan. <laughs> yes, thank you guys. Give Susan this, a round this, of applause. No, no, no. <laughs> but this is, this, this is great work. And I just think people are coming together and we are, I, I think we're going to see a lot of change and I'm thrilled about it. So thank you for, yeah, for all the work everybody does. It takes us all, as you know. Perhaps we might be able to copy and paste, Susan, so that we don't lose <laughs> all that corporate knowledge. <laughs> Let's try, right? Well, Let's try. I, I'd be happy to, to um, well, I'll contact you before I go. So <laughs> Sounds good. Thanks, Susan. Well, well, thank you all. Thanks for this engaging conversation and Susan for all your contributions. You can see this very last slide here is just the contact information for Janice and me. Um, that we coordinate these work group meetings and appreciate all your contributions. So um, thank you to the planning team and I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Close the meeting. Thank you.